I prefer really not to um, not to speak. If I speak, I am in, in big trouble. In big trouble. And I don't want to be in big trouble. Uh, Turn me up, kid, Spiral. <laughs> Looks all good. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of If I Speak podcast. I've got um, a very special guest today. I've been watching this man for a long time. Um, I'm truly inspired by him and his journey. And obviously, he's been on many podcasts before, so this one might be a bit jumpy, jumpy. But um, I just want to give him a space to obviously, you know, speak to us, the, the black community, because. I'm trying to like you know bridge a gap between black people and, and the traveling community so I think it's the perfect man to have on so without further ado I want to introduce my guest Mr John Connors what's the story brother what's up you? man yeah no man I, I love this podcast I've been watching a lot of episodes I love your honesty and you know actually one thing about you man is there see, there seems to be this pressure among young Irish who descend from Africans to put on an English or American accent particularly with hip hop and stuff and that and you do the opposite mm-hmm. You stay authentically you, working class, dub. And I love that about you. You know, I love that. And in your honesty, you're ruthless. <laughs> yeah, and I love that. But like, honesty is controversial these days. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, so. I, see, I see a lot of which, like I said, before, which season one, I felt like I just, and like David said to me before, it's going to be like my worst season in a sense of I'm new. Do you get me? Mm. But then, you know, I said, right, before I go on and speak on podcasts, I'm going to do some research and know what I'm talking about. So obviously watching you as well, I know you, like, you're, you're an actor and stuff like that, but... I didn't know we were speaking off camera a lot and your activism, you really fight for your people, you know what I mean? And that, so similar to you, that, that's me, I want to fight for my people. So one of the things I want to do, um, I do in this podcast, I, I have a little section called What's the Gig, which is what's the story basically. So um, ba- obviously yesterday you've had a very busy day, so I want to give you the platform to you know let people know what you've been up to the last two days and what's been going on where you live and stuff because it's absolutely shocking and I know this is going to come out like later on but this is just a platform for you to let the people know what's been happening around yeah so in my campsite in Old Bell Camp Lane in Darndale basically for the past 25 years my family have been living there now we lived up the road before that just a mile down the road the other side of Bell Camp Lane but we were living there without facilities for like 15 years 17 years and finally after I got kind of a spotlight uh, thrown at me after Love Hate, I went on a media campaign and uh, essentially after my family had campaigned for years to get electricity, essentially the council finally installed electricity in the camp. Now that was back in 2014, they were meant to be back a week later to install clean running water and toilets, that's it. Mm. And we're waiting eight years. So for the past while, my mother's been getting sick and she's in bed up until yesterday. My grandmother's getting really sick in and out of hospital with stomach problems. So it just all kind of came at me at once there. I think it was Monday morning. And I said, fuck this shit. Mm. You know, I have to get back on this buzz. Mm. So um, I did a few videos and people are starting to watch them. And I went into the council with a bottle of water straight out of my tap, <laughs> the I brown know, water. I so I went into them. <laughs> And then I threw it in the Liffey afterwards, blew it in the Liffey. Just to, and then I asked them, did they want to swap our portlets for some of their toilets? And then I asked them, uh, would he be happy with it? And I actually got someone in the council to admit on the phone that they would not live in them standards. Yeah. So a lot of media has kept behind it now. Uh, I think something's going to happen. If it doesn't, I'm just going you know, to go in there with a big group of people and we're going to have to take the protest even further. You know what I mean? This is what you have to do. Mm. But it's, it's disgraceful. And we talked about this already. Like a lot of things you would give out about in Ireland, but we do have a, you know, we're, we live in an inherently decent, country mm. the, li- the living standards is, is you know it's a first world country but still yet my family living in a third world condition so that's just not right so something has to happen about that man so the fight must go on 100% bro I know you were saying yesterday I, was watch- I watched all your videos every single one of them yesterday it's like first world country but you're living in terrible conditions and like you said like would they do that to someone in a council estate that's non-travellers? They wouldn't. No. So why are they doing to, to you? I don't, I don't understand that, man. I really well, don't. The tra- Living in them conditions, like... The traveller the, the traveler situation is a very unique type of discrimination, and I'll tell you why. Because 500 years ago, um, during the reconquest of Ireland, um, essentially two-thirds of the Irish population were travellers. They were nomadic. They travelled. That was the Irish thing. And the Brits hated nomadic people because nomadic people were not in one place and if you were not in one place you couldn't pay taxes to king or queen mm. so they hate the nomadic people all across the world whether they were africa whether they were asia whether they were europe whoever they colonized the brits so 
the targeted nomadic people in Ireland, which was the majority of the population, and that population just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller until they became what we now know as travellers. Mm. So when the Irish Free State was formed in, in 1922, 1923, they start talking about the ugly image of the tinker in the countryside that would deter foreign investment from America to rebuild the country after it was blown up after uh, the Civil War. So we, be, we were targeted from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, into the 60s, into 1963, which was the 1963 report on itinerancy, because they called it itinerance. And Charlie Hawhey, who later became the, the on shirt he led that commission, and he was looking for, and I quote, the final solution to the itinerant problem. Now, that was the exact words that Adolf Hitler used against the Jews, the final solution to the Jewish problem. So use that, use that without any irony. And from that commission, you had um, people who were elected officials suggesting to sterilize traveler women, castrate the men, or put them all out in Spike Island to be... Uh, to, to die away as a breed or take one less from the itinerant class or take their kids from them. And we know that traveller children were, were largely um, disproportionately taken as well into care homes and into industrial schools and magdan laundries. So what you're seeing is the result of the generations of that, this sort of level of apathy, this sort of level of just... Uh, 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 discrimination, state discrimination. So it's it's accepted. Like, like really, it's the, only, it's the last uh, discrimination in Ireland that is still embraced. At least if someone's racist against whatever community, it's not seen as cool generally. It happens, of course, but people will say you're cool. It's not like the KKK are out there. But with travellers, and a part of it is, Dongo, is because we are white, and they get to say well, they're not racist if they discriminate against us. That's how they get away, but they get yeah. to feel all, um, how would I be racist? No, sure, I have a black friend. Yeah, yeah. But fuck them knackers. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So mm. that's a part of the problem that we're, that we're up against, and it's an ongoing one that's deeply seated in the Irish psyche and uh, we just have to get we get used to it we get used to hate and that's what it, that's what makes us fight back it's what makes us be boxers and what makes us who we are I suppose in a way but at the same time it, do, it does add to the suicide rate which is the highest suicide rate per capita of any people in the world 11% of travellers die by suicide you know what I mean it's seven times higher than the national rate of Ireland it's an, it's an epidemic it's the number one killer among travellers so discrimination like that for successive generations from a state level causes an internalized hatred and shame you know even though there's an exterior pride with travelers there is that internal hatred and shame that comes from discrimination you know what i mean 100 percent. you spoke about suicide there and just before we we piggyback a little bit i just want to i don't know if you've seen um the young lad i think let me not get his name right but he's a mcdonough anyways he's from Condog. I did say that. Patrick McDonough, his name is, yeah. yeah. Just R.I.P. to him. R.I.P. Um, to him, exactly. 12 years old, I think he was. There's a mate of mine I was speaking to yesterday. She was telling me, like, he was getting bullied. I, I, I first thought it was TikTok, you know what I mean? Yeah. And obviously, even me, when I posted the TikToks that you were, we were talking about earlier on, the response I was getting, oh, they're this, they're this, they're that. How could you love them? But that all this, I'm just like, bro, it was like, <laughs> we have, even in my own community, we have people who are bad. We have people bad in like the non traveler yeah. Every you have bad everywhere. I don't exactly. know why. I don't know why these guys get castrated so much for for stuff that other people do as well. But just rest in peace to him. It, yeah. it was. I think the missus sent it to me, and um, I was just like, for fuck's sake, like the bullying and stuff like that. And like you said, yeah. the highest suicide rate amongst like the world. Mm. It, it's shocking. But um, I want to like obviously get a profile on you and piggyback a little bit. So just talk about like obviously you have risen above all them you know, things that were against you, that stopped you to the point where you are on television, you're out here doing your thing. What was growing up with you like, like where you grew up? Like, talk to us about your childhood a little bit. Well, it's funny because um, my father and mother got engaged. They were engaged for about two or three years and due to be married. And uh, this is the late 80s. Obviously, travellers have long engagements. My father was a schizophrenic. And one night while they were engaged, he was, she wasn't with him, he was alone, or he was with somebody else, he was drunk. Mm. He hijacked a taxi oh, and crashed into a wall and broke his hip. Jesus. Then he got put on armed guard in the hospital. Mm. Now, this meant that, uh, that basically the marriage was going to be put back another two or three years because he was going to go to prison. Mm. So my mother went to visit him, and my mother escaped him out the, the hospital window, and they jumped on a ferry and went to England. <laughs> and then I was born in London because of that. Okay. And uh, that's a fact my brothers will never let me live it down. Yeah, you guys did for that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? It's a thing that shaped me mm. because I was always I always had to be more Irish then. Yeah. Because I didn't feel because especially being born in England, man. Because yeah. mm. the England fucking colonized us. Yes. And I'm born in fucking England. Mm. You know what I mean? So that shaped me and we and I grew up in the camp with like fifty two, fifty five first cousins in mm. the camp, second third cousins, twelve aunts and uncles. 
uncles, grandparents, friends of the family, like like a reservation, like a Native American reservation, is the only way to explain it, mm. fields all around us. And uh, 20, 30 of us could have been born in England and we were the so-called English cousins. Mm. And all of us had that chip on our shoulder because we weren't born in Ireland. <laughs> and then they were all born in the fucking rotunda or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but good childhood for a lot of it. And then like my father, obviously, he had mental health problems and I witnessed him trying to kill himself. I called the ambulance for him one time when I was eight probably. And then finally he did kill himself. So that, that def- obviously at the time you don't realise you're a child, you're just seeing a problem and you're being confronted with you don't know what's going on really. Um, as in you don't know how, how it's going to affect your psyche or your unconscious, you know what I mean? But obviously I started acting out after that and I got really angry and I was getting bullied a lot. I was getting bullied in school by settled kids, calling you knacker and pikey and even teachers and getting segregated. That's the shocking part. Sorry for coming across you, John. Mm-hmm. I remember, I, like I said, I was watching you on YouTube, you were talking, I think you were talking to Tuberty. And you're with this lady, I forgot her name, she was blonde anyways, and you were saying, like, a teacher was calling you, I wouldn't even repeat that, mm. but a teacher was calling you that, like, what? what's that like, bro? The no, teachers, the teachers hit me even. I got hit by two different teachers, yeah. Mm. Uh, a male teacher and a female teacher. The male teacher grabbed the cone and bet it off his head, and I was about 10, 11, and he never came back to the school. And we were put in all traveler classes, like, you're talking about segregation, you yeah. know, like, this. You, that's something you would see in Jim Crow laws in yeah. America in the 50s mm. and down south. Mm. This was happening up until two, three years ago in Ireland, and I'm only 32, and that was prevalent. Like it was typical for travellers after they did their communion, once they went into third class, which is usually the bigger school. You know what I mean? To say second class is the junior, is then you'd go into an all traveller class with travellers of all ages, and they would just give you colouring books and they wouldn't educate you. And that's what they did with me. But I was academically very bright, and after a couple of months in that class, I, I finally tell me mother. I said, we're to being put into this class and we're doing colouring books and shit. And she was like, what? You know what I mean? Do you know what it reminds me of? It? Actually, it was a, it, I, I, I said to the teacher, I said, why are we doing colouring? Why are we not reading? And he says, you can read. And it reminds me of that scene in, in Life with Martin Lawrence and Eddie Murphy. Did you ever see yeah, that? Yes, yes. And he goes yes. in and he goes, hey, Jerry, can I get some of that pie? And he goes, how did you know my name? Well, it's right there on your shirt. You can read. And it's so funny. It's the same fucking, it was the scene that actually happened to me with the teacher. I couldn't yeah. believe I could fucking read. Yeah. Because it was a traveler. Yeah. So my mother went over and kicked up a big fuss and ended up getting back out of there. And myself and my brother Joe did really well academically. I was the highest tested person ever in class to do history secondary school for the entrance exam. It's not a brag, it's just the truth. Yeah. But that's to, to, to give an example of yet, yet being academically inclined since a very young age and been able to read before I could even walk, still they put you and all travel class, colouring books and all that stuff. So you grow up with that kind of hatred. And then with travellers, they treated me differently and my brother Joe because we ha- our father committed suicide because mm. it's such a stigma, and especially then. Mm. It's just a real sign of weakness, like you killed, yeah. he killed himself. Yeah. And also the fact that you just didn't have a, a father to show you the manly way in a very manly culture. Now, what I mean manly culture, the, the men go out and they're the breadwinners, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, so yeah. that's just the way it is with travelers. Mm. So we were seen as less than because of that. So we were getting it kind of from both ways. And then I ended up, because I was getting bullied so bad, um, I ended up joining a boxing and it's so much rage in me. I remember joining a boxing and Darndale Box Club, old Joe Russell, Barlard, he called him from town, old school boxing trainer. And he said, uh, he saw me and he said, this is your fourth night, your last night. At the end of the night, get your coat and get the fuck out of here. Fuck right? But well, that was his way of testing you yeah, to okay. see if you had it. Mm. So I went and just put me fucking living soul into that training session and jog and everything. And he saw the kind of rage in me and he, uh, he said, come back Wednesday. And me two mates came and he said, you two fuck off. <laughs> right? yeah. So within six months, I won a league title, a Dublin title, all Ireland title and the first Irish champion in five years in the club. And then next year, the same. And then I got a silver in the, in the four nations which is England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, which really pissed me off. And then the next year, I got the goal to beat an English fella in the final. And uh, the night before the fight, he came up to me and says, I'm going to knock you out, you paddy cunt. And I said, not in typical kind of Irish being humble and all. Mm. But I went in and knocked him out. And then I brought the DVD back to me brothers. And uh, the Irish national anthem coming on at two, and I said, so "You should be fighting for Britain." <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you couldn't win, man. You know what I mean? So that was growing up around Darndale, man. And then it just a lot of street fighting, to be honest. Mm. Like kind of dirty goes as travellers would call them on the streets of Darndale would settle fellas or whatever. Mm. And then bare knuckle fights, then with travellers and a lot of kind of chaos. Stuff that I didn't know what was happening, like we were talking about with Amy earlier, kind of unresolved trauma and mm. stuff you just don't get. You don't understand really what's happening. You're, you're not mature enough, you know, your frontal lobe hasn't developed enough yet to understand. And the concept of trauma is like, you know, an invisible concept. It's not real in your head. Mm. You know what I mean? So there was all that chaos and doing loads of mad shit in my teens. And then 
then it kind of all hit me and I couldn't understand what was happening in my brain and I got really depressed, gained loads of weight, injury after injury, quit boxing. Always planned on coming back, never did. And then I got in a really dark depression and, and I was trying not to kill myself and I thought of my mother because what she went through with my father. But ultimately I decided to kill myself and right in that moment when I decided to kill myself, my brother Joe knocked on the door mm. and um, he said, are you going to kill yourself? And I was like that mad spiritual moment. And it reminded me of when I was a child, I heard my father call me, John O, John O, John O. And I went to my mother, I said, Mommy, where's daddy? I didn't know he was meant to be in a mental hospital. What she didn't know, he escaped a few days previously and killed himself. Because the guards came in an hour after, I heard them. So that kind of serendipity and spirituality has followed me. That's why I couldn't be an atheist. So when Joe said that, kind of freaked me out. And I said no, but I gave him an indication. Yeah, because I was too proud to say it, but I wanted to talk. So we start talking, and uh, what happened was he said, "Look, you need to you need to get something else. You need a new purpose, a new meaning." And I've told the story a few times. And uh, he said, "Why don't you try acting? Because I spent all my fucking dole on fucking buying DVDs and going to the cinema. I didn't care if I went and watched fucking Sex in the City. It didn't matter. I watched anything in the cinema just to escape. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I ended up ringing up Kathleen Warner Yates at the Abbey School of Drama and Music, and I said, uh, "I want to do acting." And she said, "Have you acted before?" And I said, "No." I said, it was adult for fun. Now, I was depressed. So adult for fun didn't sound like my buzz. I needed a new something, you know. I needed something intense. So yeah. um, I said, uh, anything else? She said, uh, 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 some intensive course. I said, yeah, I'll do that and blah, blah, blah. And I borrowed the money on my brother and my uncle and my mother. I think I got the bus fare out of my mother. And uh, the first night, I got it around the circle. And there was all these people from upper class backgrounds. I'm like, hello. And I, was, I, was, I was fucking knacker from Darndale, you know what I mean? Like standing out like a sore thumb, man. Mm. So I got really intimidated and felt kind of inferior to yeah. people. And because they all had degrees in acting and all, which I still think is a, a ridiculous uh, concept because it's one of the things you can't quantify through education. You're either actor or you're not. And um, basically, I was decided to leave because I was intimidated before it started, you know. But an improvisational game began between this upper class Dublin fella from a kind of Fox Rock background, let's say, mm. and this black Brazilian man. Mm. Now, the game unfolded and the black Brazilian man was a shopkeeper mm. and the other fella was a, was a customer. And what the customer said kind of dictated the improv game, do you get me? Mm. So he ended up being kind of patronising into a man's accent and to me, racist. I've told the story loads of times on record. I've heard you, I've heard you say this. Yeah. And basically, I got fucking angry, man, because again, solidarity, like you're talking about, so you have solidarity with the bros, it would be yeah. the same, because yeah. we all know what discrimination feels like 100%, and bro. how it makes yeah. you feel like that. Mm. So I start getting angry and I said, I'm going to kill this fella. And then the end of that, that improv and the upper class double fella became the, the, the shopkeeper and he wanted a customer mm. to do the improv. So I just said, yeah, out of anger. And I left the room, we said to leave the room and get in character, as they say. And I was going to leave then the building because I was that fucking terrified at the same time. But I, I said I was just too angry. So I ran through the door and I robbed the shop. And I slapped the face off the other actor. And then I took the shoes off him, I took the socks off him. And I was halfway taking off his tracks of bottoms. <laughs> when the teacher stepped in, I said, John, please stop, please stop now. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> so I ran out the door and I ran downstairs and she chased me and yeah. the next stairs and the next stairs and then down the street and she said John will you come back please please and I said what and she said John you're fucking mad but I liked it I said okay she said don't ever touch any of my students again come back up mm. and when I went back up they gave me a <laughs> they gave me a round of applause but I think they were all terrified this fucking mad knacker from Dardell but uh I did that 10 week course and then fell in love with it. And it's mad, man, we we're talking about before, you know, you don't see where your life goes and from younger days, you don't get it. And it can go any way, but once you start actually thinking positively, that's the first trick. Mm. Go fuck it, I'm not gonna think so neg negatively anymore, you know what I mean? And I started thinking, shit, things can actually happen for me, you know what I mean? I'm not just a victim of my circumstances. I am that, but that's not the told sum of me. Mm. And then that's what kind of clicked with me. And I was going, right, okay, I do have more barriers than the average person, right, coming from my background, but they're only barriers and you can jump over barriers. So when I decided that, and I decided nothing's gonna stop me, it's like where Conor McGregor texts me one time and he says, they're never gonna stop what keeps coming after he saw me if the speech. And he's so right in that saying, in that mentality, they don't stop what keeps coming. And I've had to come back a number of times. I've had to come back from political scandals and scandals, cancellations and all this stuff. But the reality is, man, the only thing that can stop you is yourself. And I've learned that now. Now it's tough, but I mean, it's not gonna stop you. And I think, I think that's the test. If you're willing to withstand all the pressure and the hurdles, 
that's the test if you're actually going to succeed. Like, and then you'll be better than the, those cunts who got a leg up because you had to work harder and you'll be more skilled than what you do. That's what I've realized. And that's the, bro, that's the reason why I have you on, man, because I'm, I'm going to learn a lot from you, bro, because you don't give a bollocks, and I love that. I love that. About and you. Neither do you. That's yeah, what I no, love about I, you. I do. But you know, I, no, at times, though, like, when we spoke about you, I don't want to really mention his name because I've mentioned his name too much, but you know what I'm talking about. We spoke <laughs> yeah. about you, fella. After that episode, I did think, like, you know, there'll be a lot on my corner, but it wasn't really like that. It was kind of split in the middle, do you know what I mean? Though? So it did, I was kind of taken aback, but then I'm stubborn, do you get me? I said, you know what, fuck that, I don't care. I'm still going to be outspoken. I'm still going to be, you know, this and that. I don't give a rat's what anyone says. So I, I am going to keep going, especially like the way you are. Well, as soon as you stop you know? being you, man, uh, yeah. people are not going to relate to you. I relate yeah. to you because I can see that's an authentic cunt. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You're, you don't care and it's no, you know what I mean? There's no airs and graces about no. you. You're being honest, man. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's going to attract an audience because yeah. people want honesty in this yeah. time when people are being so PC and people are censoring themselves so much. Authenticity is now con controversial honesty is controversial but people want that they want to hear real fucking opinions whether it's pop culture whether it's class whether it's about race whether it's about any of these so or whether it's just fucking having the crack yeah. and saying things like you said that in that video about but it was the girl you were saying yeah just, when i when i yeah when I went <laughs> you know what i mean Cause yeah no because man I, I said to the boys already because man you, lloyd oh, i'm in there you 45 were just minutes i was you were just no, talking you yeah exactly you weren't yeah. you, weren't, you yeah. weren't in there for 45 minutes no. five minutes 45 five minutes. Five minutes six seven <laughs> on a good day uh, yeah. but come here john who just, needs 45 minutes no, man? that no, sounds like a cross sweet man yeah 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. but i want to ask you that I, I don't like i said i don't want to say the word because i don't want to say but you keep referencing yourself that K word from yeah, from yeah. Darndale. Yeah. Have you embraced? The, are, are you are you, not, are you using that as power to yourself? Ah, yeah. Because you've been called so. Because yeah. me me and myself, yeah, you get called like a black cunt or the mm. N word or whatever. Mm. Yeah, I'll never like embrace it. But mm. why 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 do you keep referencing yourself? Well, when I'm doing, I'm referencing what how, if you look at the context I was. So using, you don't give a power. No, no. With the context I'm using is how deep were looking at me, and I knew that. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. this knacker from Darndale. Mm. You know what I mean? But no, man. Like for me, even look the word traveler doesn't even encompass who we are, because traveling is just one aspect of our culture. Our culture is, is rooted in deep Gaelic Ireland and the two clan culture of Ireland. That's why we live in campsites around each other. That was the old clan culture, and you see, we're a reminder of the past for a lot of like settled people and and that's a big part of why there's so much shame against us you know what i mean because people have been just colonized so much in this country mm. like you know you have to remember the british were here for fucking 800 years mm. you know what i mean the eradicated culture language religion uh, cultural practices and we held uh, held on to so many of them mm. we're actually not travelers we're mink carers that's who we are in our language you know what i mean like okay. so that's actually who we are that's spiritually who i am do you know what i mean like mm. but no i don't really use it like that we might say we might say like actually it was a funny i remember i remember we were making cardboard gangsters and me and the boys me and the boys who were in the film we were all having we were, i had this i had this house in ireland my mother's house but she moved out mm. but i said mommy i says we say mommy you know what i mean yeah, yeah i yeah. says mommy yeah. i says uh I said, can I hold on to the house for a few months because I want to live in there with the lads out of Carver Gang so I get in character together, do you know what I mean, and go mad. So anyway, we were session them mad in the house, man, I'm telling you. I got this, because when I moved into Darndale, what happened was, within a week, we had a hundred noise complaints from my neighbours and we never never done any noise, yeah. right? One of our neighbours called their, their Wi-Fi knacker neighbor, knacker neighbours because they thought we wouldn't even be on Wi-Fi because we're that stupid, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's the discrimination that's we harsh. got, right? Yeah, yeah. But now in saying that, we had elder people there and they were lovely, but it was all the younger people all very discriminating against us. So I fixed them anyway. When 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 I knew what my mother was leaving, I held down the house for an extra six months and I used it for carpet gangs for a session house <laughs> and for the location, yeah? So I went over to my cousin Bean once my mother moved out and went over to me cousin Bean I said Bean give me that 5 ounce speaker you have I'm taking that for 6 months and he said yeah 100% soups we said soups yeah right? I know what soups yeah, 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 yeah. 100% soups so I took it and I swear to God I had that on 24-7 even when I was on set yeah. I had to go out on set I left that on <laughs> and the guards come knocking that's the door the <laughs> and every time the guards come and I said oh I'm sorry guard and I just turn it down and the minute they go that's it you don't need to do one visit a night because it's Darndale yeah. do you know what I mean yeah. so I had them up and I had them fucking terrorised man mm. and we went mad back to the story I was saying to you that song Juicy mm. where by Biggie. Biggie if you yeah, don't yeah. know now, now you know, know. but yeah. we say knacker yeah. travelers oh, do right so if you don't know now you know knacker that's what we say so we're there with I don't know if you know Ryan Lincoln he's a friend of mine he's from Bally Money he's a rapper Linko well, Linko Linko is a half Ghanaian right mm. and he uh, so we're all there and we're there and it's 6 in the morning we're assessing and it's about to come into that part if you don't know now, and he's looking at us they're thinking are we going to say the n-word do you know what I do yeah. I was that 50 cent today yeah. and I'm looking around yeah, yeah. who's going to say the word but and yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. he's looking at us thinking we're 
you're going to say the N word, yeah. but we go knackered. Yeah. He says the N word, and it was just some laugh, man. Yeah. It was just that. It was just an interesting kind of observation on language and meaning and slang and all that stuff. But uh, and then we just fucking wrecked that house for another six, eight weeks. I put me whole, I put my head through a chair in the fucking scene, yeah. and uh, we tortured them neighbors. And I'd say the hate travels forever now. <laughs> yeah, let them leave them. Right, I, I wanna, I wanna um, ask you about your acting as well. So obviously, I know people are watching this. Are gonna scream, ask them about Love Hey. Mm. So let me ask you about Love Hey. How did that go? What, what was the gig with that? How did you get into that? How was I, that conversation like to get into that? Do you know, man? I was, I was in the Boxing Club, and I remember a cast and director, an assistant of the main cast and director, come up looking for tough looking fellas mm. to jump into Love Hate. Now, I had already gotten a part uh, in King of the Travelers, which didn't happen yet. This film, mm. and. I I was rehearsing for that and I remember saying to saying that we said I need to get on a film set because I'm gonna panic once I get on, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just thinking I'm gonna fucking go shell shocked, you know what I mean? Mm. So when this woman came in and she's looking for tough looking fellas, I said yeah, and I landed on the set and then basically a few lines were going on it. Not a few co coke lines, but a few, uh, <laughs> a few script lines were going right. <laughs> Boy, <yeah. laughs> and me and the director hit it off and he was yeah. living in England for t in the Caledonian Road where I was born in King's Cross as well. Yeah. For thirty years. So we hit it off and I said, I'll do it a few lines. I'll do it a few lines. <laughs> but I said to him, that's not what someone from Darndale or these kind of areas would say. And he said, what would he say? And I said, blah, 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 whatever it was. And I said it. And then I met the writer a year later after I did King of the Travelers and another film Stalker. And I met him in Galway Film Flat, the writer of, of Love Hayden. He said, See them lines you improvised, you cunt. You had me wa awake at night. They were so good. Mm -hmm. I said, No way. He said, I'd love to bring you back. Mm. I said, Oh, Jesus, that'd dead, be deadly because I only did a couple of lines of it. Like, you know what I mean? So he brought me back in a bigger part, uh, season four, had a lot of fun. And then season five, he said, Look, you can come back now in a big way if you want, or you, or you can stay. I said, Of course I will. Mm. So then we worked on kind of the cultural stuff, the character stuff, and stuff to bring in to make it authentic. And I came back in a big sort of bang in season five then. And it was, a, that was kind of, that was when like life changed for me. Yeah. And hasn't, you know, hasn't returned as in profile getting spotted, all that, that kind of changed forever. After the first episode in which I said the Nidge, take it back with you and use it to buy yourself a headstone. And that became a meme and I was yeah, like 200,000 yeah. people. I remember watching this, like, brilliant, man. Just brilliant. crazy yeah. shit, you know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. So that kind of was mad. Mm. And like, you kind of got this mad fame. And it, What's the, what was that? Because I know the travelers are humble people, yeah? Mm. Even me, like I said to you, John, earlier on, like I said, like, I know out in the streets getting love and all that, but like, obviously, Travelers showing me love, being a black person, mm. like I said, we we know each other's pain. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. I know you you told me like this is your video going around in WhatsApp groups. Yeah, that's why that's how they know. Oh, and the boom boom room, yeah, the yeah, yeah, room. Yeah, yeah. You're going all around the boom yeah. room just for the audience, you know. That's all. Do you know what I mean? We're but, always sharing your yeah, all your stuff and that, send it out to WhatsApp groups. That's madness, bro. Because yeah, they're coming up to me in the yeah, gym. Yeah. These lads, remember when we saw them in town? They're like, oh, we're gonna go viral together now. Yo, in these boom, oh, hundred percent. But, but yeah. slam, I wanted to ask you, what's that like? People coming up to you. Like and asking about pictures and all. What was that like at first? Like, was you know, that like foreign to you? Was like, what the fuck? Yeah, it Can was. Me or it what was. was it? Well, it, it, the first week it was kind of like a, it was kind of like ah, oh, that's nice. You know what I mean? Mm, mm. And then when I went into town and I went to a UB40 gig and I got surrounded and people, people like tore me shirt off me back and I got put into the VIP then because it was such a hassle for the crowd and then the VIP did the same to me and then Ali Campbell out of UB40 said you have to remove him mm. that's how mad I went well and I said now I'm fucked mm. and then you'd go to nightclubs and fella would, fellas would ask you for fights like I remember one fella like a big fucking Fuck upper Jesus. class cunt comes up to yeah. me in Lily's and he goes hey you I'm getting a selfie with you I said uh, come again I'm getting a selfie with you I said okay I said come here he came here, he had rugby tops, you know. I said, <laughs> I said, I swear to God, I'm going to take your soul from your chest if you don't go now. And he just went <gasps> like that there and he went on. And only for the camera. Oh my God, only yeah, for the camera. We're, we're yeah, just yeah, especially that yeah. kind of entitled yeah, cunt. Yeah, yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you get them, but then you get lovely interactions, but it's when it's the crowds is too much for me. Okay. When you meet a random male person, that's grand, and, yeah. uh, and you know what I mean? Like, and you have patience all day long. And I've only said no twice ever to selfies, and I've done, I just kind of, I, God knows how many, a thousand, tens of thousands at this stage nearly. Yeah. But 
I've only said no twice to that cunt and then another person who fucking actually a woman who grabbed me fucking grabbed me fucking privates yeah 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 and that happened to me well, a lot of times you know yeah, what you're talking yeah, about yeah. like that's fucking sexual assault 100% because you know then I mean? if we do it then there's you know what I mean you know what I mean right, charge sheets all over again rightfully so rightly so 100% and yeah, yeah, will, yeah and any fucking pervert yeah, I yeah. will jump on top of them yeah, cunts yeah, and smash yeah, their yeah. face in mm. but when it happens to us it needs to be it's important to us highlight it mm. happened to me many many a times many a times you know so like there's all them interactions but you know most of the time when people are sober most of the time it's grand mm -hmm. it's just when when they're drunk they don't give a bollocks what they say or do or the, and they have no level of awareness like do you know what i mean man you could be out with your own mates and you're having an old drink and you're having the crack like and you haven't seen your mates in a while and it's an excuse to meet up and these cunts are lined up around the corner and they don't like they get a selfie they get a little chat but they stay there in your fucking air like this. <laughs> and I'm like, hello, do you have yeah. no level of fucking awareness over here? Yeah. I'm here yeah. with my mates. You yeah. fuck off. Yeah, yeah. And mm. the thing is, then they go, if you are a cunt, I met that John Connors, he's a cunt. But he don't know John Connors have been spelled all night by fucking 500 people. Yeah. So sometimes when I hear of a, a, a celebrity being a cunt, I go, if you only knew, because yeah. I couldn't imagine being a Brad Pitt level of fame. I couldn't, or Tom Cruise. I imagine being Tom Cruise. I, I remember no what, wonder that fella's fucked. Yeah, I remember watching Ronaldo's um, voice documentary. And he had to fucking hide himself. They went to Paris and he had to, like, you know, disguise himself because. And look what the woman did to him. The yeah, rape thing, yeah, the yeah, rape, yeah, false rape yeah, charge. Yeah, I know, bro. Ter I know. Terrible. It, 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 I can only imagine that level as well. Yeah, imagine, like, poor El Ronaldo. And there's a good looking man, like. <laughs> <laughs> in all fairness, like, come on. <laughs> yeah, 100%. He doesn't have to rape. No, uh, stop. You know what I mean? Stop. Like. But another thing I wanted to ask you on the acting, bro, yeah, I was, we watched Kyber Gangsters. Um, as I said, I was doing my research on you. And. How did you find adapting playing a role? Obviously, you played King of the Travelers. You were a traveler in that. Mm. You were a traveler in Love Hate. So, how did you like you know adapt to playing some of that like a settled person? Yeah. So, what, what made me laugh though about um, Carbo Gangster? You still had the slick back like a traveler. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, saying to Amos, yeah. look, he still has a slick yeah, back here yeah, yeah. like a traveler. But how did you find adapting that role like playing someone else? Would you know, man? Do like? you know what's weird? Because because we our discrimination we get is mm. from settled people, yeah. right? So, because of that, the Dublin working class accent, because we'd be mostly around the working class areas, yeah. is the accent of the discriminator. Mm. And because of that, you, you're, because you have to hold on to who you are in your pride, you're always going, if a traveler puts on that accent, they're betraying who they are. Mm. So I had a psychological thing of actually not being able, able to do that accent for years, because mm. you, you resented it, mm. because it was always, the accent of discrimination, or we, it was always usually an actor at the end of it, you know what I mean? Mm. So it was actually hard to get it, get my head around the accent. The mentality of it, not so much. Emotions and stuff, really, and those kind of dark places, I can get there pretty easy, because I'm fucking just an unstable sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, I'm an emotional person. And I'm an open wound, and acting kind of opened all that stuff, I can access that. So it took a bit of getting used, that's why we did together for seven weeks, and I just kept the accent for the seven weeks, and then the shoot, and then and then let it go after that. Did you find yourself slipping at any time? Ah, yeah, you yeah. always do, yeah. Yeah, especially when you're improvising. Yeah. Because if you if you stick by the lines, accents are way easier to do. But when you're improvising, you don't know what you're going to say next. So you need to know the accent, like it's in your fucking DNA, do you know what I mean? Like, and I learned a lot about the process, and that, like, it, it just literally, you have to just stay in it, man. You know what I mean? You have to stay in it and just especially like because we shot that in like 15 days that film so it's three five day weeks mm. so and but we lived together seven weeks mm. so it was just a matter of staying in it because you're doing a mad amount of pages man we could do 15 pages in one day like in hollywood to do a half a page a day mm. we could do 15 in one day like it's unheard of mm. you know what i mean so and that and that means that you're losing quality because you're doing so many pages and it's why you have to be even more prepared mm. than you would on a bigger budget like i see actors in big budget stuff and i go this is easy peasy but you're telling me I have to do a half a page or a page a day. Mm. Like, that's pathetic. Mm. Like, I've done 15 pages in a day, you know what I mean? Like, and that's mad. But again, even that mad energy, that added the carbo gangsters and it added the energy to it and the fucking chaos. And we just had to fucking use it, you know what I mean? Mm. No, the um, thing that I love about Travelers, bro, yeah, I said it. And these are honourable people. And the reason why I said this is because how you lost settled disputes. Now, I think I've said this on other episodes on my on my podcast this season, but I'm going to say it again, have a new one. One thing I hate about our culture, and my missus hears me banging on about every time, lads who have beef, who have feuds or whatever, will go to, so you'll have a night out, we're building up to a night out on a Saturday night. You have your club already, you know, you have your, your eyes on a girl that you want, hotels are parked off, blah, blah, blah. You'll get there, party for about 40 minutes to an hour, Towards the end, or probably at the start, you'll get two idiots 
beefing each other, fighting. It's always at a nightclub. And I don't give a rat who's watching this, and I, just, I know there's a lot of you that don't like me. I don't give a fuck. These are idiots. Every single one of you is, yeah? But one thing I like, I, I, I said it on, um, I went on TikTok saying, they were laughing at me saying, travelers are honorable. No. The way you lost set these are beefs. It's like, right, you have a problem, you have a problem, let's go me. Look, man, let's get the hands out, let's fight. And I was watching the documentary Knuckles, and um, one thing that I loved about it as well was, you'll have the two families that will fight, but they're not allowed to watch the fight. You'll get separate families from um, other families. There are two, two refs. The two lads have a knock and that's it. And then they'll hear about when you come home. Yeah. I fucking love that. And Fair I remember, I, and 100%, and do you know what it was, right? I remember, I, I'll say it, fuck it. <laughs> My brothers were telling me that if I had a fall every day, if, had a, if he had to beat me up, they were going to jump in. Do you get me? So yeah. stuff like that. They yeah. would have hopped in. You know what I mean? They're not going to let me die like that. But that, uh, that, that is one thing I love so much. Yeah. And then shake hands after, and it's done. Do you know what I mean? Like, And we were watching last look, I said, you said, like, nothing's off limits, so I'll say it. Yeah. I didn't want to get you in trouble, but we watched your fight. Mm. Bro, where's the the rest? There's no rest. There's 25 minutes straight. No war or nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 35 what? minutes. Yeah, we actually went on that. Was, I think the, that that cut out, I think it was 40 something minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cut out. Yeah, no, there is no rest. That's the thing with Bernard. Yeah. There's no rest. Straight over where, so where it gives it's up. Just that's gives it. up or, yeah. or, or if it's just a, a, a knock, someone's knocked out, mm. cow, like, mm. it's either one or the other. So that's the way it goes. But the, yeah, there is honour in it, man, of course, because. Look, 100%. You look at like you look at the inner city in Dublin and what was happening there before lockdown, before the first lockdown, people getting shooting and stabbing mm. and all that. Mm. You can't tell me that's honourable. And also, no. in the other Cowardly. way. In, in, and also, the other way, as well like you know in the upper class sort of, sort of society where they put on suits and sue the shit out of each other to me that's not honorable either to go out in a few honest thump, thumps in the face and then go out and swallow a few old guinness and sing an old song and an old black eye who gives up bollocks mm. who gives up bollocks and with travers man the thing is but people don't understand right with travers loss doesn't matter what ma what matters is going out, mm. right? Your family don't shame you if you lost. Mm. Your family shame you if you don't go out. Mm. You know what I mean? Like if you go out and you get bed with one thump, it's all right. Mm. It's all right. You you did the honourable thing. You went out and fought like a man. Mm. My grandfather used to say, at least if you go out and fight with your coat off, then your coat on. And what that meant was you took your coat off to fight, as in you wouldn't allow a man to hit your punch and walk away. Mm. You know what I mean? You're willing to fight back. Mm. And that's where the honor comes in. And that's an ancient fucking thing. One on one jewels have been going back since the beginning of man. Mm. And it's just, to me, it may not be civilized in a civilized modern society, but to me, it's the best way of doing it. And it's not something that I would condemn. And I fought loads of bare knuckle fights. You never lost, you never lost. No, Sometimes, yeah, you never, I didn't, yeah, like, that's never lost. And yeah. I'm no killer, like, but, yeah. but I can fight. And I always have been able to mm. fight. And that's, I had to fight. Mm. I, had to, I had to grow up fighting. If I didn't, I was fucked. Mm. So I had no choice. It was a defense mechanism for me. But that's the way it is. And there are travelers, plenty of travelers out there who can't fight. And they still will go out and have a go. It's a cultural yeah. thing. And if yeah. you look at, like it's an amazing statistics, we make up 0.6% of the Irish population, so less, a good bit less than 1%. Yet we make up in and around 50% of the Irish champions underage. Like, that's an unbelievable statistic. We make up the majority of the world medal winners since the year 2000. Like, you know, every year, every Olympics, we have a number of traveling on the Olympics, and we make up a tiny, minuscule level, of, and it's down to culture. It's down to the fighting culture, uh, because we are in a defensive position in Irish society. But we also hold on to this old Irish way, one-on-one -on -one of kind of jewels. You know what I mean? And I think it's the honourable thing. Now, when it goes out of hand, it turns into big stupid fucking feuds. Yeah. I'll condemn that all day long, because yeah. that's not our culture. That's when shit gets deformed. And then, as well, with the internet, the internet kind of changed a lot of things, because with travellers, travellers worry a lot about what other travellers think in a big way. So if you get on a video and you start shaming somebody, mm. right, all, like what Travis say, oh, everyone's going to see that, you know what I mean? Shadif to go back and then it's the back, the forward, the back, the forward. John, the and it turns into these sorry, stupid John. feuds. Yeah. The one-liners, John. <laughs> I know, they're funny. And they do make the us laugh. We'd be laughing our heads off as well. Call outs are yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I'd be watching somewhere, I'm like, where are you getting that from? Yeah. Like, I'm sorry you're saying, yeah, I was shite in the book. <laughs> that one there, look, what? What are you saying, bro? Yeah. It's 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 crazy, man. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. it. Because like I said, I like being a joker. I like having one on this. Yeah. And I've used a lot, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, like your mother's a tramp, your father. Yeah. What? And the outsider as well. <laughs> yeah. but, the, but travelers come up with the most peculiar shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's because we're, we're slagging culture, man. Slag, All yeah, we man. do is slag. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, like, when we meet each other, we just slag each other and tell, mm. tell stories immediately and slag. Mm. In my family, we call it mixing. We just mix that, that mix him, mix him, mix him, fix him and mix him. Mm. And there's no emotional talk ever. Yeah. There's no let's talk about our feelings. No, mix him to death. Mm. You know what I mean? And the closer you are to someone, the more you're going to mix them, the more you're going to slag them.
them. You know? yeah. Me and my cousins in the group, sure, you can't put nothing in there at all without getting slagged to death. You're terrified to even text into the WhatsApp groups. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And this is, the, again, it's just a part of the culture and a part I fucking love. You know yeah. what I mean? And or when I go out drinking with my uncles and my cousins, like, we just take turns, right? He's getting it now. He's getting it now. <laughs> and it could be 15, 20 of us yeah. on him. Yeah. And and the thing is, if you show weakness yeah. or if you show you're bothered, you're fucked. Yeah. Like, I remember my uncle, my uncle John, who was a top mixer himself, but we turned on him one night and he left the pub. And that was it then. We had to get him every time. And he's had to live in the poetry of all times. John, you're not going to like that, but it's the truth. He left the poetry. Actually, you know what he did one night? We mixed him that bad one night. Then he went in, because my other uncle started it, yeah. right? It was his brother. He went into the toilet and he rang me other uncle, his brother's missus, and said he's had to fall off the balcony, right? And he's had to crack in his skull and he's dying. And his missus comes down. Oh, where is he? Where is me? Where is my husband? That's how sick he is. Yeah. And then we all start laughing at that like and then they're getting into it so what? that's the we we'll go to man one of the ones that I love is your soft boy I got that yeah, with I remember boy, yeah. I remember John Casey shout out to you John he's gonna love yeah. this but he's the one I used to hang around with in school and obviously your cousin Patrick for yeah. and I remember I was so into the travel culture so much I was talking like a traveller I remember going up to <laughs> Blanchetown I told you about we spoke about George in Kento real quick and I remember going up there I, I told him I was a half traveller yeah do you know there's black travellers is there yeah I never oh knew, yeah, yeah, yeah. I never knew there's black, black Connors is is there? Yeah, Jimmy Connors. Jimmy Connors is a. Is there? Is it, are you mixed race? Obviously, obviously yeah, mixed yeah. Race, yeah. So yeah, there is race. that. Cause I was gonna ask you, do travelers date like black people? Is that yeah. prohibited or no? I no. never really see it. Look, it's it, put it this way: travelers are, are like some travelers, the traditional types, are against are against travelers going with anybody who's not a traveler. Whether that's settled black, Jewish, it wouldn't matter if yeah. they're not yeah. a traveler. Yeah. Some do, don't give a rat's. Say, for instance, my family. Yeah. My family are all intermarried with settled people and every kind of people. Yeah. So it depends. But if you get the real traditional West travelers, yeah. if you're just a non-traveler, yeah. particularly if it's a girl, yeah. it's going with a non-traveler. Boy, a little, not as bad. I know that sounds bad, but that's the truth. But uh, Jimmy Connors, he's a fucking unbelievable singer and an entertainer. He would have been good friends with my uncle Jimmy Connors and my father John Connors and uh, cousin of mine McCarty's he grew up with them so he's he's uh, he's from Wicklow would live around Wicklow he's three or four sisters they're all mixed race and then this is a deadly story right <laughs> I was in Liverpool right yeah and uh, I was walking down the street in Liverpool city centre and I said I need to get myself to something at McDonald's before I go out drinking right just to settle the stomach and um I walked into McDonald's and a couple of fellas come over to me and were uh, these black fellas from Liverpool and they go are you John Connors and I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, how do you know me? Like, because I'm in England. Like, yeah, why, yeah, how do you yeah. know me? You know what I mean? He said, we're travellers. So like, and I said, what? <laughs> no way. He said, we're the Black McDonald's. <laughs> I said, fuck off, man. <laughs> yeah. I said, tell me what's going on. Like, he said, well, he said, my grandfather came over to Liverpool on the docks in the 60s, working on the docks, married a black woman, and we're all intermarried. I said, that's fucking dead. He knew the language inside out. Mad. He told me what nightclubs to go to, this, that, and the other. He said, we're the black McDonald's. I said, man, that's fucking deadly. <laughs> and then he introduced me to a load of hundred other bunch of black mons, right? I swear to God, all these man, the black McDonough Martins in Liverpool, man. In the city. I was like, this is fucking deadly, man. I said, ye cunts have the best genetics ever. Oh, I said, ye should be all in boxing clubs. <laughs> fucking black travellers. But a fucking mad, man. Oh, that I man, need to into these deadly. Things, and, and there was literally 30 of them. Yeah. And they, they all knew me. Yeah. They knew me, the paddy cap man. She was John Connors, and they were talking to me in the language. I was talking now, Zublik, stall the wind, look at the bureau. I was going, what the fuck, this is deadly. So mixed, man. Yeah, stop. Yeah, I, got, yeah. I got cooked on TikTok for just because yeah. I said Bjorn, Fien, Fien. <laughs> and that's all I, cause I said, oh, I can speak gammon. I spoke, I spoke three, or four, uh, three or four yeah. words and they cooked me. But one, <laughs> of the, one, of the, one of the last things I want to ask you about, like obviously travel, I know you, you're, you're not just, just all about like obviously traveling community stuff. There's other stuff that you're into as well. Um, homelessness and stuff like that. I want to talk about that as well. But the last thing, uh, your grandmother is 50 years activism with travelers, mm. which is, that is amazing. Cause I have a friend herself. Um, she spoke to me about like being an activist, obviously for black people. And obviously when the George Floyd thing was going on and she says, it's very tiring because no one's really listening to you. That, like, you know, you're out there and you're getting called a snowflake, this, that and that. But your nanny has been doing it for 50 years. Mm. So in that time, and even with you doing yours, is there any, has there been any changes from from when she started to up, up until now that you've seen? Yeah, well, now it's gone worse in a way. 
It's uh, gone worse. Yeah, it's gone worse. Yeah, well, if you look wow. at well, if you look at the four settlement of Travers, that's what really is at the root of the suicide rate. Yeah, you know what I mean. Fifty percent of Travers died before thirty nine, so that means for half of Travers, nineteen is middle aged. Three percent of Travers get to sixty five. You know what I mean. Eleven percent die by suicide. Highest suicide rate in the world per capita. Seven times more likely to be homeless. So you just look at the stats. Stats don't lie. Numbers don't lie. You know what I mean. Yeah. There, there was time when you know there would have been some level of change around her time, and she would have backed away from the activism then. And it's just gone more hopeless now. Uh, it's something that just hasn't changed, man. But the reality is you just have to, like, you have to just educate yourself. You have to uh, put passion into things. Like, I mean, for me, doing documentaries, making documentaries, like I met one about Travers, I am a traveler, that really did, did really well. And then I met one, actually, I went to America, I met one, one about African-Americans, one about Native Americans. Ever see that? No, I haven't seen that. I'll, 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 I'll be part I'll send it to you. Yeah, we I did that. It. And what was great about that was, it, was, it opened my mind up because... I seen although history and culture might be different, discrimination feels the same mm. to everybody. Yes, you know what I mean, and it makes you feel like that, and it, and it, it gets at you internally, you know, and that's you, that's why you have to educate yourself, and it's, it's great to have find solidarity. Like we're talking about King Leopold, the Belgian fucking monarch, who killed fifteen million people from the Congo more than fucking Hitler killed and Jew, killed Jews. And yet no one gives a shit because they're black. Let's be honest. This Thank is, you very much. And that's, is, and that's and you see that that's coming that, no, that's coming from a traveler as well. Yeah, no, that's the truth. It's the European colonialism. Like if yeah, if yeah. your if the European um, uh, superpowers only give back five percent of the wealth that they stole from Africa, Africa would be the wealthiest continent in the world. And they are anyway. And even in the minerals, if you look at Nigeria and the minerals and and that Nigeria have the resources have, it's unbelievable. But that level of corruption that the British kept in place beyond colonialism, that was the old British trick. Mm. You know what I mean? So you're seeing this all around and the trick is to educate yourself, know that this has been happening since the beginning of time to people all around the world and find solidarity like me and you are today. This yeah. is why it's lovely. And yeah. I love what you've been doing for your people and for my people. Thank you. And it's that, great man. seeing that level of solidarity, man. You know what I mean? Like it is great because we support each other. We're yeah. all fucking human beings and that's, yeah. that's black, white, traveler settled everything. Like, like, you know what I mean? If we're all on the one L buzz, then you just get that kind of 10%, 5%, whatever the percentage is of fucking cunts mm. who hate their own lives. Do you know what I mean? And they, and they look to just shit on anybody to make themselves feel superior. But the reality is, if you hate anybody, and I mean anybody, you cannot be happy. Mm. Hate is unnatural for human beings. You can't be happy, man. You know, that is pathological. The hate is pathological. And uh, for me, it's about love, connecting people. And that stuff is great, you know what I mean? Because all the politics and all that, politics gets in the way sometimes and just divides us. It's really about coming to together, you know what I mean, in a, in a, in a human fucking setting. I think that's what's important, man, you know what I mean? I was walking and uh, me and we were going to, we were going out, you know what I mean, the missus and uh, another lad. And there was these people, obviously on the street, we're in Grafton Street, and I was seeing those cameras these people with cameras recording these homeless people. I'm just like, what the fuck? For me, I thought it was crazy. I'm like, what are you recording these people for? Do you know what I mean? Like to, Probably not even to ask for permission. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, just record. But obviously, there were I just thought, like, what the fuck? But to you, John, obviously, you're big on that because I've seen you on... Um, <laughs> I, see, I don't know what show it was um, you were on, but you were calling these politicians. Were like, these are psychopaths. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You were on that uh, uh, tonight, the Tonight Ivan, Show. Yeah, I think the, tonight the, show, the, the yeah. Tonight Show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is your? Like, I remember one thing that you said to me that was very fascinating. I used to think like in my head, like if I say this, I sound stupid, but you said it as well. You were like, there's empty, there's a lot of empty houses. Just put them in there. Forget about the economic side of it. So just elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, one hundred percent. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of empty houses in the country, especially at that time. And then you've you've less uh, homeless people than there are empty houses. So that's just logical. It's simple mathematics. But the reality is, they were holding those houses up because they don't want them going on the market because they ruin market prices. So it's all just crony capitalism. That's essentially what it is. And I, I think I think housing should be human right. That's what I believe. I don't think anybody should be homeless, especially in a fucking wealthy country like Ireland. Like, yeah, like we give out and, and there's all the sort of things to give out about. But in, in world standards, we're a first world developed country. No yeah. one should be fucking homeless in this country. Nobody. It's disgraceful. And you see the people in, in the city centre and that kind of, you know, people camera them like that. That's poverty porn. That's what that is. And people sort of virtue signaling or look, but they don't ask permission or they don't really give a shit. Uh, the reality is... I don't think there's a, a worse situation to be in than having no roof over your head. And now imagine having 
having a family and having no roof over your head. Yeah. You know what I mean, man? That's fucking heavy. Yeah. And I had cousins that were living in hotels for two and three and four year, one of them, and, they're, and they've kids and they can't fucking cook food because it's a hotel room and they've got fucking living takeaways and they're unhealthy and all that shit. And you see it all around. It's everywhere. It's in every community. So it's it, the reality is it shouldn't be happening in Ireland 2022 and it's still happening. Are we are in the worst homeless crisis since at the famine, which wasn't a famine. It was a forced genocide, genocide by the British. But that we are in that position, man. And it just, it shouldn't happen. It's just down to crony capitalism, essentially. Our politicians, like, we have a crazy amount of ministers, like 25% of ministers who are landowners. So then they're passing legislation on landowners. Well, that's like your heart surgeon Right, your heart surgeon being your funeral director—it's the same fucking thing. It's innately corrupt. It's wrong. It's morally wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't make sense. No, but it happens not in at Ireland all, yeah, because yeah. our elite yeah. is such a small elite, and they all went to the same school, whether it's fucking Black Rock, whether it's whatever they went to, uh, whatever college, and they all had, they all had, they all go into the institutions, go into the funding institutions, they go into politics, and they're all friends, and they go to the same places. So our elite is a very small elite, and they all look after each other. You know what I mean? So for me, it's about putting it up to them cunts. You know what I mean? Because the rest of us down at the bottom are all together, mm. really. But then we start fucking fighting with each other over stupid fucking shit. Stupid and then, yeah, and yeah. then they get it. It's a colonial tactic. The British invented it. You know, divide and conquer. Mm. That's what they get the fucking people at the bottom arguing with each other and they'll forget the fact that they're all being fucked hard without lube. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Going in dry. Yeah, <laughs> cheeks open. Come here. What? So... See with lockdown then What, what, we, what was your Because I, I haven't had a chance To really Because obviously Mine's a seasonal thing mm. So obviously When I speak about things Things that happened Fucking weeks ago mm. Months ago but What was your opinion Though on lockdown What, what was your feeling Towards that Because for me I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you My opinion for us I feel like It's the biggest Load of bullshit That has ever happened To mankind I don't Like it's it's. I, I feel like There's two years Of our lives Have been taken away And yeah. it's just a load of bullshit And I feel like The lads were talking In the group chat earlier on There was a Yoke I'll read out to you In a minute um, Ireland's now The most like you know the most expensive country to live in in Europe. Yeah, it's disgraceful. I, I, I don't get it. Look, I love and our, our, our economy is about to yeah, fucking collapse. Yeah. I love this country. It's giving yeah. me everything. All me that. Too, yeah. My my children are Irish. My like, you know what I mean, like, but yeah. I don't get why Ireland is so expensive. They feel like there's a sudden recession going on, bro. Wham bars at 120. That's disgraceful. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking. What, let's what, go out and protest. You know what I mean? Wham bars. I'm not having that. Wham bars at 120. Bro, and then so. My, my thing is this are, are we too laid back Because I thought Yeah yeah, I thought, we are bro I thought Do you know what it must be It must be that fucking I'm starting to listen to those Conspiracy theories Must be the fluoride in the water We're all getting sedated or something Because the fighting Irish Have become the sedated bro, Irish do you remember the war I was in America like, The war charges And the people yeah, fought bro Yeah do you remember when that these lockdowns came in Oh it's crazy Everyone just sat bro, And we had the most restrictions In the world of any country Every monarch every The Western longest country, as well The longest And the thing is There was other countries That didn't have half the restrictions And they had less of a debt rate than us So they didn't work The lock Lockdowns didn't work, and they economically fucking ravaged our country. Not to it's mention, focus. not to mention, destroyed the collective mental health of the Irish, and particularly the youth. Mm. You know what I mean? And then older people who died in loneliness, and people fucking then dying, and and then the family never see them again. They're waving goodbye to their family. Like it's an absolute travesty. And what happened in the nursing homes and the amount of people that that died in the nursing homes who were segregated as well from the rest of society? There needs to be a whole inquiry into how the government, yes. Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, who were two cheeks of the same arse, fucking dealt with the restrictions. <laughs> You know what I mean, bro? I 100% agree with you. 100%. No, I think it was, but, and I've seen this, I'll read this out to you, right? Yeah. So, it, Paul Murphy, I think he, this fella was, he was even, he was encouraging the lockdown, but he's here tweeting anyways, right? He goes, yeah, he's out of the people for profit. Yeah, yeah, so he's like, Ireland is now the officially the most expensive country in the EU. Prices here are 40% above the EU average. Rip off Republic, alive and well, under Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael and the Greens. We need a cost living revolt like we saw with the water charges uprising. Yeah, your opinion on I that? agree with him totally. I wouldn't be a people for a profit supporter, but I would. But I agree with him, mm. and I had some of the policies I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be against. But uh, like I went to fill me car the other day, a two liter car yeah. of diesel, one hundred and forty seven quid, man, one hundred and forty seven quid. Jesus Christ Almighty, man, and like it didn't last me fuck all, and you're going, what the fuck? And obviously this war in Ukraine and all that stuff is obviously affecting it too. But coming, at, the, these restrictions have been have really ravaged us, and the art community, the arts community, and culture, like that's only still now opening back up you know what I mean the acting community was ruined theatre was ruined film industry was ruined I went out and met a film during lockdown I said fuck this mm. I got private funding I went out and met a film on level 5 knockdown 
10,000 people a day getting infected. And I said, I don't give a shit. We're going to have to make a fucking film because I'm going mad. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? I was losing the head, man. Do you yeah, know what I mean? 100%. I said, I have to do something. Yeah. Or you're literally going to go mad. Yeah. So I just didn't even listen to them. I said, fuck them. But uh, it, it, it's craziness, man. And they better, like, they're talking about this shit of monkeypox and all. Fuck off. Yeah, that's another that, one. This is too yeah, coincidental. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. now there's another yeah, one all of a yeah, sudden coming. Yeah. Would you? Now I'm starting yeah, to turn conspiracy. Yeah, yeah 100%. I'm going, these, like, all these things that were conspiracy that, you know, they were going to bring out these passports, these, these yeah. cover passports. Yeah, the chip, all these things, were, the, the chips and the needles. But you said all, all this yeah. thing at the start, though, and all them, all them come through anyway, the COVID passports. So you're going, Jesus Christ, these, these fucking conspiracy heads, they did have a lot of this shit fucking right. And I was one of the ones calling them mad early on, and now I'm going, but they live in Jesus. Like, like I was only over in America the other day, and you want to see them out the fucking things you have to get into America. And yeah, then no, I'm over there one day. I'm over there one day and they remove all the fucking restrictions. <laughs> he said, the curse of God. That was gas. I was, I was watching the story. The curse of Sleepy Joe Biden, the cunt. Well, come here. I have two more questions to yeah, ask yeah. you and I'll wrap up, bro. Yeah, um, no man. So what's going for, what we've listened to so what's forward for John Connors what's going on with you like what's happening The Black Wealth man so that's the film I met under lockdown so yeah. The Black Wealth were a group of people in ancient Rome that wanted to uphold the power of the Pope mm. and the Pope to run the economics of Rome they were Pope loyalists so anybody went against them including Virgil the Poet who wrote Dante's Inferno where this is kind of loosely taken inspiration from, were banished or massacred. So they were really bad people. So what we're saying in this film, it's a modern film set in an urban Dublin inner city about intergenerational clerical abuse, but it's about a gangster who is the result of the trauma, of the intergenerational trauma we were talking about earlier. Mm. So unresolved trauma comes to collect, that's my belief. So it's essentially, uh, that f it's a very serious topic, but it's, it's in the sort of gangster genre. And uh, it's finished now. And... Um, it's going to be out probably the end of the year in the cinemas. We've already been offered a cinema release. And it's going to it's gonna hit like a tidal wave of every confidence in it. It's going to do really well. So I'm really on that front foot now. And I just finished a documentary about me granny okay. as well. So that's something I'm really passionate about. That's coming out as well. And then just juggling things, man, hustling, man, basically. You know what I mean? You know what it's like? 100%, bro. And then lastly, I, I always ask this question. I want like people who are come, are that come on. Again, people are doing cool stuff, and obviously we come from tough backgrounds. And you've explained already what you lot go through and stuff. So, just advice for that that minority, uh, like that community, that and minorities that are trying to rise above their circumstances that don't think they can go anywhere in life. What's your advice, like what, what you've been through and what you've had to navigate? What's your advice to that, like people? Yeah, to and I and I go around. I do, I do go around with schools and working class areas, and I do this in traveller centres, and I, and I've come around to this thinking. And it was a revelation for me, right? So I was always fixated on fixing the system and fighting the man at the top. But the reality is you can't fucking win, right? Because if you look at the history of activism and you look at great activists, like people I would have looked up to, I would have looked up to Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X is my Malcolm guy. X is my he don't guy. smoke. Yeah, yeah he don't smoke. But what happened? <clears throat> What happened? Yeah, so you have yeah. the Jim Crow laws, you have all that stuff, you have the civil rights, you have the segregation. So Malcolm X dies, Martin Luther King dies. What happens? The discrimination gets smarter. The system gets smarter. Mm. So they go, we don't need it to be this obvious. We don't need, we'll just bring the wages down. We'll just incarcerate more of you. We'll get smarter. It's like Terminator, it keeps involving. Mm. Do you understand? Mm. So fuck fighting the system direct because they're just going to find a way to come after you, mm. right? And going, oh, fuck, 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 we just fight them. No. The only thing you can do then is turn it inwards. Turn it in at yourself. And realize what's very important. If you are a victim of oppression, discrimination, the classism, whatever it is, realize that you are. That's great. Be fully aware of it. That's brilliant because that's going to be your firepower. But don't adopt the victim mentality because that's what I see too much of. I see with trainers and they're giving out and, they're and I'm going, it's just not going to help you. It's not going to, because you can be a victim until the day you die. And guess what? You died in and your whole life is over, and you've wasted your whole life, and you're on your fucking deathbed, and any potential you have is gone, because you decided to zone in on your victimhood. You know, we're all fucking victims. You have to fight against that. And that, because it is a thing that's hard to resist when you feel like a victim. It's hard not to feel sorry for yourself. This is natural human fucking instincts. You're going, oh, I had a hard, like, I had a, do you not empathize if I had a hard? But unfortunately, life is hard. And it's harder for some people and easier for some people. So you need to focus on you, the individual, and what you can fucking do. And you understanding that you cannot be fucking stopped. You cannot be stopped. You can stop yourself. And that thing of hurdles, you jump over hurdles. You just jump, 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 jump. But a hurdle is not being put in a padded cell with fucking duct tape over your face with a straitjacket. A hurdle is a hurdle. 
We can't get out of that cell. But that hurdle, you can jump over it. It might get higher or it might be higher than it would be for someone who comes from Fox Rock. But still, it's just a hurdle. Jump the fuck over it. You're going to get more skillful than them cunts. You're going to earn it more. And you're going to have more consistency and longevity in your career. And that's it. So it's no... That you're a victim, use it for firepower, but don't become a fucking victim. It's never going to help you or your family. Appreciate that, John. That's actually solid. I'm going to take that because I feel like we've had this debate before. Do do black people have that victim mentality? And as we well? do as well. Yeah, and that's and, understandable. Yeah, it is. Cause that's, a, that's a symptom yeah. of trauma. Yeah, and a symptom of discrimination. Mm. But we have to get wiser than that. Yeah, we can't let that define us. You know what I mean? Because it doesn't help us. Mm. It only helps the cunts who hate us mm. because we stay in a victim position. And that's where they want us because then they rave like, look at them, they think they're the victims. Mm. Nah, I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we'll end, John. I appreciate you giving me your time, Thanks bro. for having me, bro. Oh, 100%. A, a pleasure, and I've been a fan of you for a long time, man. Oh. And yours is going to blow up and go bigger and bigger. I know that for a fact. And it's down to your authenticity, so... This is one of the best I've done, so thank you for having Appreciate me. Appreciate that, bro. And make sure, where can you find on your shows? John well? Connors on Instagram, and yeah, just I'll, I'll sure pop up giving out somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> make sure, guys, like, subscribe, and share the fuck out of this, because I, I hope this is like, I want to do impactful stuff, and this is going to make an impact on people. So, obrigado. Thank, thank you, bro. Dave. Appreciate that. I prefer really not to, um, I was telling not to speak. If I speak, I am in, in big trouble in big trouble, and I don't want to be in big trouble. Turn me up, kid, Spiral.